Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the special collections of the main library here at Hong Kong U. I am Gary Chin, the library's public relations and development manager. In collaboration with the Hong Kong Trade Development Council and the Hong Kong Book Fair, the main library is pleased to present the miraculous history of China's two palace museums, a book talk by Mark O'Neill. Tonight's moderator is Mr. Julian Stargard. Mr. Stargard is a senior research associate at the University of Sussex and is ranked amongst the world's leading 252 commercial mediators by Who's Who Legal Publication. Mr. Stargard has written a number of articles, authored or co-authored several books, and curated various exhibitions in Cambridge. Mr. Stargard is the honorary secretary of the Hong Kong branch of the Royal Geological Society. The society awards scholarships to Hong Kong students. Mr. Stargard first visited Hong Kong in 1969 and now called Hong Kong home for more than two decades. He is active in public service with a focus on dispute resolution, vulnerable persons, geography, history, and takes every opportunity to promote Hong Kong as Asia's best jurisdiction. Without further ado, may I now turn the, the mic to Mr. Stuttgart. Mr. Stuttgart. Stuttgart. Sorry. <laughs> well, uh, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'd love to be the Honorary Secretary of the Geological Society, but I'm only the Honorary Secretary of the Geographical Society. Geographical. Sorry, Gary. Uh, just a plug there. Um, it's a great honor and a privilege to introduce Mark. Myself, I don't think he needs an introduction. Uh, he's a prolific author. We were joking earlier that he could uh, operate his own book a month above. Uh, <coughs> not quite, but he's written, researched and written widely. Uh, Mark came to Asia in 1978, which is a year before I went to university. Um, and, but he doesn't have the gray hair. <laughs> Don't know what happened there. Uh, Mark spent a lot of time in Beijing during a, a very interesting period of transformation in China's history, modern history, and latterly has been based in Hong Kong. He has always been keen on understanding the roots and origins of the subjects that he's writing about, and this has led him to write the books that he's written. Uh, he, he is a, a fantastic speaker. Uh, and always in great demand. So please join me in welcoming Mark. Well, thank, thank you very much. That's all the exaggeration, of course, anyway. I'm very grateful to the University for inviting us this evening, and also very grateful to the Trade Department uh, Council for coming to arrange this. Your mic. The microphone is not working. I think it's working, but it's faint. Okay, that's better. Mm. Yeah. Now today, uh, I want to speak about uh, one of my books, which is called The Miraculous History of China's Two Palace Museums. Now maybe you think I'm exaggerating with this title, but I'm not. Because when we interviewed the then um, director of the National Palace Museum in Taipei, she described to me the story that is explained in the book and one of the questions I asked her was well how could it possibly be that these thousands of pieces that left Beijing in 1933 arrived in Taipei in 1949 without loss, without theft, without fire, without damage and she said there are two reasons one is the devotion of the staff who looked after them through this odyssey of 16 years and the other, because she's a devout Catholic, was the miraculous intervention of God. So that is what gives me the liberty to put this in the, in the title. And I think when you understand the story, I think you will agree with her that this is not exaggeration. So, first of all, can I ask how many of you have visited the two Palace Museums? Who's been to the Beijing one? 
And who's been to the Taipei one? <laughs> wow. Wow. Well, why do we call it one country, two palace museums? <laughs> because they are twins. Everything you see in the Taipei Museum comes from Beijing. Now, in recent years, they've done some purchases of their own, and there have been some donations from, from Taiwan individuals, but uh, the vast majority of what you see all comes from Beijing. So everything comes from the same um, um, uh, palace in, in Beijing. And uh, as you can see from these figures, uh, the Palace Museum in Beijing is the most <coughs> popular museum in the entire world. Uh, and the National Palace Museum in Taipei is now in seventh place. So these two museums are the greatest repositories of Chinese art in the world. So here's a, a picture of the Beijing Museum, which of course was the, the, the home of the emperors for two dynasties. And here is a photograph of the Taipei Museum. <clears throat> it was built in the 1960s, and it was built at the um, foot of a mountain. And most of the items are stored inside the mountain. And this is because in the 1960s, relations between Taiwan, or the ROC, which is what I should really call it, and the PRC were very bad. So President Jiang was fearful of a Chinese invasion or at least bomb attacks by the PLA. So he instructed that this museum be built at the foot of the mountain and that the pieces be kept inside the mountain. So if the PLA bombers hit Taipei, at least the pieces would not be damaged. Now who's this? <laughs> this is Puyi, right. So what happened in 1911, in October 1911? Right. Now, what did China do differently to what the British did, the French did, and the Russians did when they had their revolutions? Right. Now, the other three countries thought, if we leave the, the, the emperor, the king, alive, the risk is he'll come back, or his supporters will bring him back. So the safest way to end the dynasty is to cut off his head. But the Chinese revolutionaries didn't do that. They allowed... Puyi and his enormous court and his the ladies and the eunuchs to stay inside the palace. So the Republic of China was set up, a new government was set up, but Puyi remained inside the palace. And not only that, the government gave him a huge annual subsidy, which was extremely generous. But as with many rich people, the subsidy is not enough. You know, everybody wanted more. So what he started to do, he and his courtiers and the people in the court, they started to take the pieces out and take them to the okay. markets around Beijing and auction them to increase their income. So many members of the new government, especially intellectuals, especially those who've been to Europe and Japan to study, and had seen what had been done to the palaces in these countries that had been turned into museums, they began to become alarmed, because if we don't stop this, the pieces will all disappear. And we should turn the museum, the, the palace, into a museum. So this finally happened uh, on in November 1924, and the warlord at the time, who's in, char in charge of Beijing, took took the initiative and said the, the, the emperor has to leave. So the first chapter of the book described that very extraordinary day when the, 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 the troops are sent there, they tell the emperor to leave. The emperor says, well, okay, but you know, I, I, I can't leave now. You've got to give me several weeks, several months to organize this. They said, no, you've got to leave today. And so with great reluctance, uh, he left with his top courtiers. Not everyone left immediately, but that's how it started. Now, can you guess who these people are? Many of them in the court. Eunuchs. Thank you, yes, many eunuchs in the court. So, of course, they had to leave. They had to leave too. They didn't have to leave on the first day. 
but they had to leave over the next weeks. So, the emperor and his staff have left, so we've now got this enormous palace, and nobody has any idea of what is in it, what kind of items, how many items, what they're worth. So the first job that the new administration has to do is do an inventory. So this is what is then done, and they found this astonishing figure, 1.17 million pieces. And the, the way the inventory was done was also very, very informative, because they're very afraid that the people doing the inventory will also steal items. So they set up a regimen that whenever a room is entered, there has to be a record that it's entered at what time, who enters it. It cannot be less than two people. They inspect the items in the room. Then they seal the boxes that they looked at, and then they have to put a seal over the top of the box. They, they then come out of the, the room, and then they lock the room. This is to prevent the people doing the inventory from stealing anything. And they have a great sense of urgency, because as you know, the early years of the Republic of China were not at all stable. The government was not strong. There were many different sources of power. And Pui was still alive. He was in Tianjin. And many of the former government members, they wanted to bring him back. And some warlords wanted to bring him back. So they, they felt, if we don't do this quickly, this may happen. We must get the inventory done and get the museum open. So this is a, a photograph from uh, 1925, when the museum was open. And this is a man called Mr. Wu Ying, whom we will talk about a little bit later. And he was one of the main officials involved in the inventory and running the museum in its early years. And this is his son, Wu Zuguang, on the left, uh, and the son with his wife. And uh, I was fortunate in Beijing to meet Wu Zuguang, and um, I would love to write a book about his family. So if any, any of you would like to write me a check, I will start on the book tomorrow. Okay. So the new museum opens, people start to go in, but we, we now have a change of government, and the new government says we should bring the emperor back. This proposal was not accepted. We then have a very senior official of the Kuomintang who says this museum is not compatible with the Republic of China. Republic of China is a new start for China. This is a feudal remnant of the past. What we should do is we should, set, we should auction off the items and we should make a new museum for the, for the new country. So this was discussed for about two months and finally the idea was not accepted, so it didn't happen. And the early years for the museum were very difficult financially, because as you can see, within the government, there was not agreement about what it should be. So they had to live off um, entry tickets, books, uh, museums, donations. So this is a photograph of those officials in those early years, and they are the heroes of this story, because it's they who preserved the items as they were, prevented anybody from taking over, and as you'll see as the story progresses, they were the ones that looked after the items until 1949. So I'm sure everyone knows who this gentleman is. No. That's right, that's right. So now, the Japanese uh, have conquered uh, Manchuria. They're now starting to move into northern China. And the government has to take a momentous decision. They know their army is not strong enough to withhold the Japanese if they decide to take over Beijing. So they decide we must move the most important pieces away in order to protect them from the Japanese. But nobody wants to do this. Nobody wants to take responsibility for taking this shipment, because it's the first time they have ever left the palace. And imagine anything happens. 
there's a fire, there's a train derailment, there's a robbery, there's a flood. That man who is in charge of the shipment, he will be remembered forever in history as the man who lost these pieces. So nobody wants to do it. So finally, the man who did it was Mr. Wu Ying, whom we've just had about. And we have a description of the meeting with the director of the museum in which he persuaded Wu Ying to do it. So the whole thing was supposed to be a complete secret. Nobody was supposed to know that this was going to happen. Because, of course, if the Beijing people found out that they were moving the treasures, but not moving the people, what would they have to say about that? Are we not more important than these artworks? But the news leaked, unfortunately. So in Suzhou, uh, there were a thousand bandits, I mean, a very organized armed gang, and they were waiting next to the railway station, and they were going to attack the train when it went through and take all the pieces. But the whole thing was done uh, in, at night. The train carrying the pieces was uh, highly armed. They had uh, soldiers with machine guns on, on the roofs of all the carriages. And when the Suzhou bandits saw how well armed the train was, they decided not to attack. So, in this first move, there was nearly 20,000 crates. And this is 1933. And as I mentioned, this odyssey is going to last for 16 years. Nobody imagined that. So here's a photograph from inside the Palace Museum on the days before the first shipment. So that they are be put into boxes just before they were taken out. So the pieces arrive in Nanjing, and uh, Mr. Wu is quite delighted the pieces have arrived, and then he asks the central government what to do now, and he <laughs> discovers that <laughs> there's a disagreement. They're not decided where to put them. So Mr. Wu is there in Nanjing railway station with all these thousands of artworks, <laughs> and waiting orders from up above. And of course, he's terrified that there will be a fire, uh, people will come and rob the, the carriages and so on. So finally, it's decided they should go to this place, which is the Roman Catholic Cathedral of Shanghai, which has very good uh, vaults. So this is where they were taken initially and put there. But of course, Shanghai is not part of the Republic of China. It's a foreign concession. So they're very keen that the, the pieces would be returned to the territory which is controlled by the Republic of China. So they build in Nanjing a proper facility to store the items. So this is one of the doors. As you can see, this is a modern storage facility. And they bring the items from Shanghai to <coughs> Nanjing and they put them in this facility. And there's a <coughs> one of the big universities in Nanjing. So what happens now? We're now in 1936, 1937. Yeah. So they, 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 there's this horrific war, the Songhu War, in the autumn of 1937. It's one of the great wars of World War II. And Chiang Kai-shek loses his best troops, his best officers, his best artillery in this war. And then the Japanese start to advance on Nanjing. So the government is faced with the same dilemma as before. What do we do with the pieces? So they make the same decision. We have to move them again. But now it's an even worse situation than before because uh, Japan has already conquered most of the advanced areas of China. The central government is going to retreat to Chongqing in the southwest. And as you know, southwest of China, the area between Nanjing and Chongqing has no railways. The roads are very poor. The main transport is by sea, is by river. So not only is the government, the factories, the civil servants moving from Nanjing to Chongqing, but we've got to find a way to move the, the art pieces as well. So all this is described in, in great detail in the book. So there are three main routes. From Nanjing, one is to the northwest and then down to Sichuan. Another one is along the Yangtze River. And another one is Changsha and um, uh, to the south and then finally to, 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 to Sichuan. And I want to give you another story about this artworks against the population. 
The pieces were in the Hunan University uh, in a storehouse. And the Guomindang officer in charge was given a secret uh, telegram saying tomorrow the Japanese are going to bomb Changsha. So he ordered immediately lorries to come, put all the pieces on the lorries, and three, four, five in the morning they took the pieces out. At 7.30 in the morning, the Japanese bombers come. And as you know, the Chinese cities had no air defenses. It was, it was, it was hopeless. And many, many people were killed and many buildings were destroyed. But not a single artwork was, was destroyed. So again, the, the officer made the decision that he was ordered to make, to move the pieces. So here are some images of this odyssey. So as you can see, the roads were very poor. Um, transport was very much in shortage because everything was being moved to the southwest. And the pieces were given priority. So they were, they were put ahead of people, uh, factory <laughs> materials, um, civil servants, all but the elites. They were, they were, they were given very high priority. So these are the officials of the museum, and this is a picture they took of themselves en route to the southwest. Here's another one. Uh, this is a place in Sichuan where they were being stored. So they are being put on the lorry. Here's and this is a place uh, in a rural part of Sichuan, and they were held there for quite a long time. And as you can see, the conditions are not at all appropriate for keeping artworks. So the, 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 the art staff, the, the staff and museum, they slept in the same building. They were afraid that, that people would come steal the, the pieces, that the rats would come and eat them, that there would be a fire. So to protect them, they lived with the pieces all the time, like members of their own family. That's how the director put it. So what, what year are we in now? Yes. So this is the, the victory over Japan. So this is August 1945 in Chongqing. This is a victory parade. So I asked the director of the Taipei Museum, well, did the Japanese steal the pieces? Because remember, thousands of pieces were still left in Nanjing and Beijing that they didn't, that they were not removed. I said, did the Japanese take them? She said, no. They only took copper because they needed them for, for munitions. And of course, I was expecting, coming from Europe, where the Nazis looted artworks at an enormous scale, that that's what Japanese would have done. She said, no. So I said, why not? And this is her answer because China was going to be part of the Japanese Empire, so these items would now belong to us. So it's a great irony of history that the whole point of the Odyssey to protect the pieces from the Japanese was actually unnecessary. If they'd left them, if they'd left them in Beijing or Nanjing, it would be OK. Anyway, so the pieces go back from their caves and their huts and their places in the mountains, and they arrived back in, in Chongqing in 1947. So where should the pieces go now? Where do they belong? The capital is Nanjing, remember? Okay? So I'm sure you've seen this photograph. Can you, I think you can identify four people in this photograph. Yeah. yeah. And behind uh, Chiang Kai shek on in the second row, his son, his son who is called Zhang Jingguo, Jing Jing then the future president, and on the on the, the Guaylo, who is the Guaylo? Yeah, 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 George Marshall. His job was to try to make a peace deal, but he failed. So we have civil war. And the communists win the civil war, and Chiang Kai shek decides to retreat to Taiwan. And so he decides to take with him what he considers the most important items from the Palace Museum. 
and uh, the archives of the foreign ministry and the country's foreign reserves and the gold. Uh, and remember, the move to Taiwan is temporary. You must remember that. Uh, when I was studying there, they repeated to me this constantly. We don't like Taiwan. It's so hot, so many mosquitoes. It's much better in Nanjing. I can't wait to go back. I've got a lovely big house there, you know. <coughs> so this was just a temporary move. So he took with him what he thought were the most important items because for him they were the symbol of his rule. He was the president of China. Um, Chairman Mao is a bandit leader who is not legitimate. Gong Fei, that's what we used to say. Now, Chiang Kai-shek did everything possible to bring the intelligentsia of China with him because for him these were also part of his, his authority. So this is Ma Hong. Ma Hong was the director of the Beijing Palace Museum. Chiang put great pressure on him to go, but he decided not to go. And he also forbade any of the pieces from Beijing to be moved. So the ones that went to Taiwan are only those that are already left, had gone to Nanjing, had gone to Chongqing. The pieces that remain in Beijing remain there because of him. He stayed. And this man, I'm sure you know. Hu Shi. Now Hu Shi decided uh, not to stay, and uh, he went to Taiwan, became foreign minister. So he he he, he was successful for Chiang Kai-shek. He got him to go, but of course many intellectuals they decided to stay. So here's a, a photograph of this extraordinary migration that happened. You know, end of '48, early '49. Everyone is trying to escape. So you you read in the book the battles between the people and the artworks to get onto the boats. Because mm -hmm. everybody, everybody wants to leave and the, 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 there's not enough space. So do you take artworks or do you take people? So the pieces arrive in Taiwan and remember we're only there for temporary. So they find this place in Wufeng in central Taiwan and they put the pieces in there. It's like a cave. And they build a very small exhibition room nearby. And this is far from Taipei, it's far from Kaohsiung, very remote place, because it's temporary. And uh, the, the priority, of course, is to increase the defense forces, get people to have more sons, and prepare for the invasion of the mainland. So here's a photograph of the administrators of the this Wufong facility. Now this is a very famous photo. Can, can anybody tell me where this photo was taken? No. We're talking about Palace Museum. So where is it? <laughs> it's taken in Beijing and what, what, what is next to Mao Zedong? This is the wall outside the Palace Museum, right? Now, Chairman Mao never entered the Palace Museum, never. He went to this place several times. He wanted to have a look. He looked uh, inside. Now, why would he never enter the Palace Museum? Well, he, you know, he was very um, believed in geomancy and fortune telling and, you know, shrine. So he went to one of these fortune tellers, and they said, look, if you enter the, if you enter the palace, the, the emperors will be very angry. <laughs> yeah, because you are now claiming to be emperor. So if you enter the palace, bad things will happen to you. You will fall sick. You may die. So he never, he never entered. So this is the nearest he came to entering. Okay? Now, the other communist leaders, they did enter, but he never entered. So this is now August 1966. The Cultural Revolution has just started. And this is the most dangerous period for the Palace Museum. Far more dangerous than the Japanese occupation. As I said, the Japanese occupied Beijing and they didn't take anything except for some copper pieces for the war. And at this meeting, Chairman Mao said, we must destroy the four O's. 
Now, here we are in Tiananmen Square, and, you know, behind us is the greatest symbol of traditional old China. So the Red Guards say, tomorrow, we, we are going to destroy this piece of feudalism. So this gets heard by the communist leaders, and Zhou Enlai, who has at least some understanding of this issue and some feeling for the pieces, he orders the, them to close the gates and to, to put the uh, soldiers in there. <coughs> so the next day, the, the Red Guards, uh, we can't say attack, but go to the, the museum. The gates are shut, and the soldiers say, you know, go somewhere else. Now, of course, they looted and pillaged lots of places in Beijing and the whole of China. So there were plenty of things for them to loot. They didn't have to go to the Paris Museum. But this decision by Zhou Enlai saved the Paris Museum. So they were, the museum was closed for, for five years and the staff were sent off to do political studies. It's, uh, you know, Wu Qi Gan Xia. And they were humiliated, of course, because they were intellectuals, they were knowledgeable about the past. And the ones with the greatest experience and the greatest knowledge were humiliated the most. It was a really what had happened to everyone. And there's a very good account of how the, 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 the museum reopened. It wasn't really a, a well-thought policy, but Kissinger was going to make his secret visit. Remember 1971? And how are we going to impress Kissinger? He's going to arrive in China, everyone's on a bicycle, everyone's wearing blue cotton jackets, you know, everyone's in rations, there are no cars. He's going to think we're pretty, you know, hopeless. However, if we show him the Palace Museum, that will shut up. Because anybody who visits the Palace Museum, especially a foreigner, of course, is overawed by it and feels very humble and that we have no cultural civilization to compare with this. So just for Dr. Kissinger, the order was given, you've got to clear everything up and we've got to reopen it. So here he is, meeting Chairman Mao, and then after he met Mao, he was then given a tour of the Paris Museum, so it's nice to hear. The museum was open again, okay? So, I mean, there are lots of things I could show you from the Paris Museum, but just here are the two, two of them. Now, what happened in Taiwan was, by the 60s, it was becoming clear to President Chiang that recapturing the mainland was going to be difficult. Now, as you know, there were two attempts during the Great Leap Forward and during the Cultural Revolution. Chiang thought, this is the moment. The Chinese people are starving to death. The country is in chaos. Now is my moment to come back. But unfortunately, there were many American spies within the KMT government and the army, and they told Washington. And Washington said to him, no. Because if he attacks the mainland, then America will be forced to intervene. And America didn't want to. So they prevented him <coughs> launching the invasion. So he had to accept the fact that he wasn't going to go back. So this convinced him that rather than leave these items <coughs> in this remote caves in the middle of Taiwan, he should build a proper museum. So this is what he did. So this is the thing you see now <coughs> in Taipei. And um, these two items are the most popular items for mainland visitors. If you go to the Taipei Museum and you meet some mainlanders in the foyer and you say what you're coming to see, that's what they'll say. And, and these are amazing pieces of artwork because they're just, you know, food items. But the, the artists have created this, these works of art. So since Dr. Kissinger's visit, uh, the Palace Museum in Beijing now is used for this purpose. And whenever they have the big visitor, presidents, kings, heads of state, they always take them. And while they may talk big, you know, and have, have you know, make threats about against China outside, once they go in there, they fall silent. <laughs> and they become very humble. <laughs>
So this is the first meeting between the heads of the two museums. So the lady on the left, on the right, she's the one that I interviewed. And I can't tell you what an impressive lady she is. She's so really remarkable. Um, and I think you can tell by now, these museums, they're not independent museums. They're hostages to their governments. So this meeting was only possible because we're in the KMT era. President Ma is in power. Relations with Beijing are very good. So the two sides can have a meeting and they can have some exchanges. They can have joint seminars and so on. But she explained to me that they won't lend any pieces, lend any pieces to any museum in mainland. And why is that? Yes. Yeah, they don't believe the, the, the mainland government. Now, they're happy to do it to Japan or France or Austria or Australia because they signed this agreement, this very standard agreement about insurance and payments, give everything back. But the mainland museums won't sign this, so they won't lend anything. Now, it's not so the other way around. The Beijing Museum has lent some items to Taiwan. They've been there and been very successful. But overall, it's a very good era now. Except now we have the president size in power and relations with Beijing are bad. So, unfortunately, these kind of meetings now are not, are not possible. But that's not the wish of the museum directors. No, I mean, this is done by the political leaders. Now, I'd be surprised if anyone can tell me what this is. Yeah, this is the National Palace and Museum Southern Branch in, tai in Taiwan, in Jiayi. And this is an initiative of the DPP. So they, as you know, the DPP power base is central and southern Taiwan. And so this museum has some items from the Palace Museum in Beijing, in, in, in Taipei. But it has a lot of other items, like Japanese, Korean, Indian, Iranian items. And the message of this is, we, Taiwan, we have links with many countries in the world. We have a lot of links with the mainland, but that's just one link we have. Whereas if you go to the National Palace Museum, the only link is with the mainland. So it's the DPP way of saying, we, Taiwan, we, we, we have, we're part of the Asian family. We're not a subsidiary of, of, of China. But it's a very nice museum. They have many nice things to, to see. OK. So I talked for too long. Anyway, welcome your questions. So when they first moved these, these uh, 20,000 boxes out, so how much was left in, in Beijing? What is the proportion that were moved and what is the proportion that were left in, in, in Beijing? Well, the, the vast majority remained in Beijing. They only moved a small portion because, as, you, as we showed on the slide, 1.17 million pieces were in Beijing, so they only moved a small, small portion. But if you ask people in Taipei, they'll tell you we moved the best items. Because <laughs> <laughs> that was the order of President Chiang Kai-shek, you know? And, and we were also told by 
Beijing officials that uh, that most of the pieces have been stolen by Chiang Kai Shek. Uh, 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 no, this this is this is not correct. I asked the question to, to the director. She said no. We were the Republic of China was the legitimate government of China until October the first, nineteen forty nine. So until then, we had the authority to move the pieces anywhere, and we moved them to a part of Republic of China. We didn't move them to Philippines or the United States or, or Europe. We, we moved them to another part of the Chinese territory. So you cannot say they were stolen. That is incorrect. No. <laughs> no. Even, even given Beijing, they said that all. Oh, most of the pieces were stolen. Well, that's not correct. That's incorrect. Taiwan Museum. Because, correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is that the director is actually a political appointee instead of a, a civil servant. So if there's a change, if a new president comes on, on board, then the president can appoint a new director. Um, I, I don't know whether you have any insights why that's the case, because it seems rather unusual, I think, for, for a director of a museum to be a political uh, appointee, even for a government-run institution. Uh, well, you're correct, uh, because the museum is a government department. The museum director has the status of a vice minister. It's a very important job. And you're right, when the new government uh, comes to power in Taiwan, they have the power to change the director. But I would say the people they choose are well qualified. They don't choose a farmer or a, a, you know, someone who runs a car business to run it. These are people with a background in uh, art, art scholarship, art study. I'm certain the two I interviewed were extremely well qualified for the job and had worked in the museum for a long time. So you're right, they were political appointees, but they were well qualified for the job. Hi, um, thank you for the sharing. And uh, my question is, when you talk about how they move the um, artwork, uh, like a long journey, how many people are we talking about? Because uh, I suppose you will need quite a lot of people to, to, to carry out the whole journey. And my second question is, if you need that <coughs> amount of people, you would attract a lot of attention. Has there been any incident that, you know, they were being under attack or, or people who try to rob them? Can you, can you share that? Uh, well, as I tried to explain, the moving of the treasures was a national priority for Chiang Kai-shek's government. So after the Japanese army was approaching Nanjing, uh, the, the officers were ordered to move the pieces. So uh, the officers were able to say, I need 10 20, 30 rush, uh, uh, lorries, I need drivers, I need petrol, and you will give them priority over other items. So, um, the number of museum officials was not so many, but the number of people, as you say, involved in the transport and the storage and was, was thousands to move the, the pieces. Um, but it was because they had a military priority, they were able to move so many over such a long distance. Now, as I mentioned in the beginning, the later director said none of the pieces were damaged or destroyed during the Odyssey. Now, I really find that hard to believe when we look at the distances, um, even despite the great devotion of the, of the staff. Um, but um, this, is, this is what she said, so... Uh, I, I can't, I can't contradict her without evidence. So that's what she said. Excuse me, Mr. O'Neill. I guess you you may have been asked uh, this question umpteen uh, times, you know. But uh, I presume you must have been to the uh, two museums, right? The two twin museums, to quote you, uh, many times. So how would you uh, compare the uh, the two. Uh, my, my question uh, emanates from the fact that I was watching a documentary, you know, uh, about the museums and the, the, the Chinese uh, 
do you call him a curator or what? He was saying that uh, actually now the Beijing one has even more pieces than the Taiwan one. So in terms of uh, quantity, they have already surpassed Taiwan. He, I don't recall him say anything about uh, quality, but I'm just interested in your personal take of this. You know, thank you. Well, I have to be very careful in my answer. <laughs> uh, can I say what they put at the end of, of uh, films? You know, I'm reflecting only my personal opinion, <laughs> not that of Hong Kong U or KTDC. Okay. Um, when I go to the Taipei Museum, I think it's a fantastic museum. It's very, very modern. I think the items are very well displayed. I think the, the, the humidity, the temperature, the, the handling of the items is very well done. They have excellent guides to show you around, explain things. They have many loud mainlanders walking around. And they have guides with big placards who say, please keep quiet. Don't, not silent, quiet. And they don't say it. They just, it's just written. And I think that's very graceful and very respectful. <laughs> and when I visit the Beijing Museum, I, as a foreigner, am overwhelmed by the size, the grandeur, the, the architecture of the, the buildings, and the history in, 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 connected with this place. And that is what overwhelms me more than the pieces that I look at. So I think the Taipei Museum is, is more or better as a modern museum for keeping the pieces. And uh, Beijing is, a, uh, is one of the world's most remarkable architectural treasures. So I'm pleased to tell you that uh, the director of the Beijing Museum has, has listened to me because he's building in Haidian District a modern museum, just like the one in Taipei, where they're going to put a lot of pieces where they'll be kept better. Because I think he realizes, yeah, the, 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 the Palace Museum is not very suitable for keeping a large number of, of artworks. But this is just my personal opinion. Yeah. Um, I just want to note, um, because uh, in your uh, presentation, you said that um, the first uh, inventory release was uh, prepared uh, sometime in November 1924. And then, um, is that the first, my first question is uh, whether this uh, list still exists. If that is exists, uh, have anyone do the comparison that, uh, because in that list you said that there is around uh, 1.17 million items in that list. Okay, have they reconciled uh, with the existing uh, inventory at Beijing to see uh, how many items are either moved to Taiwan or on elsewhere? Yes, uh, as far as I know, the, that list that was drawn up still exists. And the number of pieces they have in Beijing now is greatly increased because a lot of time has passed. They've received many donations from, from private individuals. Uh, the museum is quite wealthy, you know, they buy, they buy, they buy, they buy items. So I think, uh, yes, all the lists exist in Beijing. And I think they would have a very, very distinct idea of what they have and what is in Taiwan. That means they, they will know that uh, um, maybe some items, if that is not in Taiwan and then not in uh, Beijing, then that means that items are either damaged during the, the transit, during the war, or being uh, taken away uh, by someone else. Yes, so they would, they would be able to know that. Thank you, Mark. Thanks for a fascinating talk. It's it's so interesting. It's amazing. I've been to both those museums, but you know your insights really give it, you know, a real understanding about why it ended up the way it has. Yeah, 
Um, it must have been a labor of love to write this book. How long did it take you? What drove you to want to write something like this? Well, I, I, I was interviewing this lady that you saw in the photograph, and as you can see, she's extremely elegant. She was wearing very elegant outfits. <laughs> she was in the reception room of the National Palace Museum, and it was very elegantly laid out with art pieces. And she described to me in about an hour, she gave me the outline of this story. And I was just hypnotized <laughs> you know, by her, by her outfits, by the beauty of the pieces. You know. So I was sort of busy at the time. But as soon as I wasn't busy, I went back and I went to the library and the, the, head, the head librarian came out and I said, would it be possible to write a book about this? And she said, give me five minutes. And she went to office and she came out with a pile of, of documents, wow. a huge pile of documents, as wow. if she'd been waiting for someone like you. <laughs> and ask her this question. So, really, in this pile of documents, there was all I needed from the from the Taiwan side yes. to, to write the, to write the story. Wow! Because you know it's very important for not so much for Taiwan but for the ROC's legitimacy. Yes. This story. Yeah. And as you know, especially since President Tsai took power, the communists have been squeezing the national international space off of the ROC. So it's very important that they stress what they have, the value of what they have, how they came to have it, the fact they had it legitimately. As you see, it's the biggest tourist in Taiwan. So it's a very important thing for Taiwan. Yeah. So then we visit Beijing, of course, also. And we weren't able to interview the director there, but we interviewed some very nice officials lower down, and they also gave us the official history. So as a matter of fact, it was not so difficult in terms of research, because we have the, the two main accounts. And then the librarian said, you must also read the accounts by our staff who made this odyssey. And there's one person in particular, and he wrote three books. And he, he worked in the museum for 70 years. Wow. So he started in Beijing as a teenager. <laughs> and then he went with the pieces, you know, to Nanjing and then Shanghai and then to Sichuan. And the, he was given the order to go to Taiwan, but it's a military secret. It's a military secret. You cannot tell anyone. Can I tell my wife? No. He can tell his wife. <laughs> so he goes to... He goes to uh, Taiwan with the pieces, but not his wife. Oh, and of course, if you're a general, you know, or the president, you know, then you can take your wife. But if you're a lower official, you can't. So his wife was remained behind. So we were we bought these books also, and they gave you a very detailed account of of, of what happened on individual days, you know, during the war and, and so on. So. So actually, it was not so difficult to to, to write it, but I, I must express my deep gratitude, especially for the staff of the Taipei Museum, because they couldn't be more helpful. But as I said, I think they wanted the story to be to be told. Yeah. Yes, and I think then there will be a wonderful opportunity when Hong Kong has its Palace Museum that maybe you'll be invited to curate it. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I'm pleased to say that. You remember there was quite a fractious debate yeah. in the legislature yeah. and the, the opposition was saying why do we have to have this? Do we really need this museum? Mm -hmm. And the chief executive, she was then the chief secretary, yes. she, she had a copy of my book and she waved it at the opposition and she said, <laughs> you want to see how important this is? Yes. Read the book. Well done. Yes. So I sent her an email, I said thank you very much. Madame. <laughs> so whenever I give a presentation now, uh, we're giving one uh, on the 19th of July in the book fair about the new book. So I've invited her to to attend. Very and good. I said I never forget how much you promoted the last book, so <laughs> but you've come to this too. Yeah.
Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. O'Neill, for your talk. Uh, I think um, I think the Chinese government and the Taiwan government are, right, are rather sensitive in these days because of President Xi's uh, stepping up to the presidency. Do you feel any political sensitivity when you interview the people you talk about in the book? And do you feel any political sensitivity from the two governments when you are writing the book? Of doing research for the book. Yeah, well, I, I, so I try to explain that these museums are both, are both. How can I say they? They are part of their governments. They are not independent museums. So their destiny is very much tied up with that of the government. So um, uh, during the Ma administration, there was a lot of exchanges between the two museums. There were meetings, there were seminars. As I say, the Beijing Museum lent items to, to the Taiwan Museum. But since President Tsai has taken office, the, the, these exchanges have stopped. So I think the officials are very sensitive to this, and they have to be very careful what they say. And you know, if they, if they, if they meet, no, not if they, if they go to Japan or they go to a third country for a, a, a academic seminar. You know, and then there's the director of the other museum there. I think they have to get advice first. Can I speak to him or her, and what can I say? Because it's because it is politically sensitive. Not not so much should the pieces go back to China or not. Not that issue, but just as you say, because relations are bad, so that affects everything. So when they talk to you, do they have any kind of political collectiveness? I'm uh, sorry, correctness. Well, uh, I asked the, the, the not the, not that director, but the, the one who followed her, uh, about whether they had stolen the pieces, because many people in the mainland say this, and I've given you her answer. Yes, yeah, she, she was very emphatic about that. She said, if we'd taken them to Philippines or abroad, then you could say that. But we were the legal government, and we moved them to another part of China. So. So, you know, she was very clear on what was the official line. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Thank you. Uh, I was wondering whether you can name any individual, I mean, apart from Zhou Enlai, uh, any individual who contributed significantly to preserving and protecting these treasures, both in Taiwan and also on the mainland? Well, there are very many people. Um, uh, I mean, if, if you read the book, there are many individuals whom I name uh, who, who have uh, made great contributions, both in, in Beijing and in Taiwan. And in Beijing, I think the contribution is, especially during the Cultural Revolution, because it was a very anti-art, anti-intellectual era. And so they had to be very, very careful what they did. And as the best they could, they looked after the pieces. And as far as I know, the, the, no pieces were lost during the Cultural Revolution, which is an extraordinary feat. So they, the officials there also deserve great, great credit. So if you read the book, you will find the names of some. I'm not a huge number, but some of them. Thank you. Uh, two questions. I'm also interested in the people. You showed a photograph of uh, uh, the director of the Beijing Museum that was uh, before the revolution, before 1949, I think. Do you know what happens to him? And what happens to the subsequent directors of the museums? Since you, you said that uh, not one piece was lost, well, I don't know whether you, you also refer to the, to, to the ones who remained in, in Beijing. So what happens to these, uh, to these people? Well, as everyone in this room knows very well, it is very hard for us to know what happened in China after 1949. Mm -hmm. So you can go and find out the official history of Mr. Ma Hong after 49. He, were, he had the job, for, I think, for a short time after 49. Then he was given a more senior position, the Beijing. Uh, Arts 
committee chairman, vice chairman, you know, uh, important post. And then he died not so long afterwards. But from sitting from Hong Kong, it's impossible for us to know, or for me to know, was this promotion, was this demotion, because he collaborated, you know, with the Gomendang. I mean, he, you know, worked for Chiang Kai Shek. You know, I, I don't know. And then he was replaced by another person, and I can't get much information about this person because only very bare information is given to you. So it's very hard to say anything intelligent about, about uh, that. I mean, as you read in the book, there was a period in the 50s when officials of the Beijing city government proposed demolishing 70% of the palace museum because it was the same argument that was used by the KMT official, which is that now we're a new republic, uh, you know, People's Republic. This is a relic of the feudal past. This area should be turned into a popular you know, a place for the people. Why should it be uh, kept as this relic of the emperors? So this was a serious proposition in the 1950s. But this was Beijing city government, I think, cultural bureau. But it was overruled by the Ministry of Culture. So it was a revolutionary period. And in the revolution, you can do anything. So I guess we should thank the, the ministry officials for preserving it at, at that time. But as I say, it's very hard for us to get a real grasp on what, what just as it is today. I also have a second question. Do I have the permission to ask? Please. Yes. <laughs> uh, now, I'm a little bit confused about how Beijing defines uh, Palace Museum and the art pieces belong to, belonging to the uh, uh, Palace Museum. Do they really identify and, and catalog those pieces that they that they found inside the, the, the inside the Palace Jijin Cheng as as the art pieces belong to to Palace Museum, or do they really use it as a generic terms and you know all the arts art pieces that they, that they were able to lay their hands on, then they, they, they label them as, as uh, things belonging to the Paris Museum. Now, the, the relating question is, how do they relate this artwork with those artwork or the leftovers from the, uh, the, the Yuan Ming Yuan, those they, 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 they they were able to buy them back or, or, or collect them or whatever from them and do they, do they all lump them together as a palace museum exhibit or how, how, how are they dealing with this? Sorry, I, I, I can't answer your question very intelligently. I mean, what I have to say is that in the period between 1911 and 1924, when a lot of pieces left the palace, Many of them found their way into the hands of the, <laughs> the big noses because they realized what they were worth and they bought them in the art houses, the auction houses, antique shops of Beijing for a very uh, modest price and, and form uh, wonderful collections in Europe and North America. Um, uh, uh, well, I'm not answering your question, but. Um, as to the Yuan Ming Yuan pieces, I, I, I'm not sure how they're defined, and, but I, I cannot believe a museum of the size of the National Park Museum in Beijing cannot have a very detailed inventory of what belongs to them. And if, if they're given pieces or, or pieces come from some other place in China, that they're not in a, you know, a very detailed directory. I can't believe that doesn't exist. May I have the uh, permission to ask another Please. question? <laughs> I have been to, uh, to both museums. My impression, I don't know whether I'm right or wrong, but anyway, it's my impression that the uh, Taiwan Museum is exactly like a museum. Uh, very modern, very elegant, um, very proper. Look totally like a museum. And then the Peking Museum is more or less like a theme park without a roller coaster. 
What is your impression about this? No, I wouldn't like to say theme park, but as I mentioned before, it, what strikes me is it is a, part, it's a place where emperors lived for several centuries. That's what I remember, that's what I can think of, more than the pieces that I saw. Whereas, just like you, when I go to Taipei, what I remember is the pieces I saw, because that's a very modern museum. And at the end of the interview with the director, I said, well, you have, I think, 3% of your pieces are in the museum. 97% are in this mountain, you know, to save them from possible PLA bombings. I said, can I look at the pieces in the mountain? Yeah. Uh, I mean, not, not by myself, you know, with your staff with me, you know? So, so do you think that the Chinese government should consider building a proper museum for all these artifacts? Well, as I said, in Haidian district, they are building such a, a modern museum where they will put a lot of the pieces, and I think this is a very sensible idea. So may I, may let I, the palace be uh, to remain as an old palace for the people, and then a new, a new museum for the artifacts. Yes. May, may I add something to this one? Oh, I, mean, I used to live in Istanbul. Uh, in the early 1980s, and Istanbul, of course, was an imperial capital from the time that the Emperor Constantine moved Rome to what he called New Rome, but shortly afterwards, the town was informally named after him as Constantinople. Uh, and it remained the, uh, an imperial capital until Ankara was formed as the capital of the Republic of Turkey. The palace there is Topkapı Palace. And there are some analogies between Topkapı Palace and the Palace Museum. Uh, when the Republic of Turkey was formed, um, as in China, the Turks also did not execute the former Sultan. Um, <coughs> they didn't allow him to remain in his palace either, or at least not that palace. But uh, they turned the Imperial Palace into a museum. And you, you, you talked of it as a theme park. I suppose in a matter of speaking, it is a theme park, because it, it, one can't think of these as palaces in the terms that, that Europeans would think of as palaces as a, a unitary building. It is a compound with pavilions and buildings and interconnected rooms and so forth. And if the artifacts are left in situ where, where the imperial family kept them, then what you have is a snapshot in time of, uh, well, this is how the imperial family showed uh, the items that it had. Um, and some of those items were very special items. I think the analogy kind of breaks down because in Top Cover you have Abraham's staff and you have various other sacred items to believers in respective faiths. But um, you have in the Palace Museum and in the National Palace Museum you have uh, items that are of deep uh, national significance that go to the, the root of the psyche and uh, 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 the soul, if you like, of, of, of the people of China. I just wanted to make that analogy. Um, um. May I ask you whether you believe that actually no items in the uh, Beijing uh, Palace Museum uh, were lost after the uh, after the Communist Party took over the uh, as a ruling party? Why I ask this is because of uh, there will be two occasions that I think that um, uh, items will be easily get lost. Or one is um, during the change of the ruling parties in uh, 1949 that uh, 
because of the very uh, uh, mixed situation that uh, actually uh, even something is being taken away, um, it's not a very uh, big deal. And other occasions um, is um, after the opening of uh, the what well, I mean, the open door policy of uh, China uh, in uh, the early 80s. Um, I think you, you know that uh, there's a, a lot of news that um, um, items in different museums in different parts of uh, China. Of course, not the palace museum, but in, in different parts, especially in the more rural area. Actually, the off officials of the museum Actually, they stole away the items and sell in the market. And there's uh, some officials being caught actually are uh, uh, received death sentence because of the uh, seriousness and the huge amount of the uh, stolen items. Of course, for the palace museum in Beijing, of course they have. Uh, uh, I assume that they have a um, much better uh, internal control than those uh, rural museums. But still there may be possibilities that um, these items, well I mean some items, will, will have an uh, opportunity of being stolen. But what's your will? Maybe the question is a little bit uh, sensitive, but if possible, can you express your will, uh, your, your will whether that is the possibility that still some smaller items or a lot that high value items being stolen. Well I think you're quite right. I think as you say when the, the, the county government left, the new government came in, it's a period of you know people lost their jobs, new people not been appointed, it's a confused time. So that would be a good opportunity to steal things. And I would say the other time of course is Cultural Revolution because at that time, the art pieces were worth nothing. And um, we have a description in the book of uh, one of the uh, officials who was purged during that time. And she said that the, the, the rats and the mice and the, the sand you know, invaded the, the, the stores, places, and uh, you know, the, the pieces were worth nothing. So if you took one, took it away, no one would criticize you for anything. So I would say those would be the two periods, but uh, I'm afraid I can't say whether or not this happened because for that I would have to sit down with the director of the museum or people who were officials there at the time and ask them, and I wasn't able to, to do that. Yes, uh, thank you for your amazing talk. I'm wondering how uh, did or how do the twin museums describe or portray each other? So I know there is a um, connection on the curatorial level, so the curators meet each other. But how do they portray each other in the museum to the visitors? Or they just simply omit the existence of each other? Yeah, I think you're quite right. I mean, the two directors, they are very experienced art professional people and they greatly respect the other and they understand very well what is in the other museum. But uh, they are both, uh, you know, creatures of politics. Now, I, I, I don't know if you noticed, but in Hong Kong now, if you ask an official for the name of the Taipei Museum, he cannot say it. <laughs> I mean, I've asked them, and what do they say? Ah, oh, the Taipei Museum, the Taipei Palace Museum. I say, yes, but please give me the, the name, the official name. And he can't. Well, you know why, of course. So this, of course, is a problem. If you read any mainland media, they would say the, the, the Palace Museum of Taipei or the Palace Museum in Taiwan, but they will never use the proper name because that would imply Taiwan's country, but of course in Taiwan, Wali means Republic of China, so there's no, it doesn't mean Taiwan is independent, it means ROC Museum. So when we get into this area, it's tricky for the, the, the officials. So, but they are very aware of all this, so uh, they will not embarrass the other, and I think the relations between the officials are very similar, between the 
museum staff is very smooth, you know, and they want to discuss some pottery or, or, or bronzes of the Qing dynasty. You know, they, they, you know, they, they are very professional. It, it, it doesn't touch them. But as soon as we get into politics, of course, it's, it gets difficult. Well, what I think I'll do is I'll take the opportunity to ask you the final question, but basically it was more towards Julian's analogy of the Istanbul Palace and the Beijing uh, Palace Museum. I'm just wondering, because of the chaos people think that happens at the Beijing Palace Museum, is that because the museum is more about its historical uh, view and architecture, where people if you go to any museum, or most museums, they're very beautiful buildings, um, such as the Taipei and the Guggenheim and all these others in Germany. But people are focused on seeing the content, whereas you go to Beijing, to, to, the, to the Palace Museum, and basically you have this huge, beautiful building with a lot of history, and then you kind of get lost in, am I here to see the building, or am I here to see the... <laughs> the contents. And I wonder if that would be the same what Julian was referring to is you go to the Istanbul Palace, you have the contents, but you have this amazing building and you kind of get lost between which do I want to see? So I wonder if this is uh, that kind of reason. Well, for, for the government in Beijing it's very tricky because they have uh, 80,000 visitors a day. That's the maximum. It's the most popular museum in the world. So they can't shut it down for six months for you know, renovations or, or uh, you know, they have to allow people to come. So I think they're doing just the right thing, which is to build this new structure in Haidien and if possible, you know, maybe move the be best pieces there and make that a completely modern museum. Yeah, and as you say, make the, the Palace Museum more of an architectural, historical site. But, as, you know, this cannot be done quickly and uh, they must respect the wishes of so many people to, to see it. So, um, um, yeah, I think it's a, it's a, a difficult one for them. And, and can we imagine what 80,000 pairs of shoes every day does to the floors, you know, and the, and the staircases? And I mean, I don't know how they cope with all that also, you know. And I don't know, cigarette butts and <laughs> plastic bottles and everything else. <laughs> thousandly behind them. If, if I may have a second bite of the cherry, as it were. Um, my, my response to your question, Gary, would be that um, with special museums like that, Versailles would also come into that category in France. And um, there are various museums, large and small. In Hong Kong, we have the Tea Museum, which is located in um, the former uh, officer commanding British forces residence and the building itself is worth a visit to enjoy the architecture as well as the fantastic display there or <clears throat> in Yunlong there is a former police station which is a, a, a very interesting building but it houses uh, a collection connected with the local clan um, uh, or in uh, Tongchong the former Qing dynasty fort which was then a primary school, uh, has a little uh, pop-up museum created by the local people of agricultural implements. And one goes to see both the building and the collection. And I think that's the case at Topkapi Palace and at the national at, at the Palace Museum in Beijing. One goes to uh, see the palace itself, and it gives one an insight into how Imperial China was ruled and how at times the emperors were completely isolated from their environment. Their environment was inside that palace, which was living in a bubble, um, uh, as much as to see the, the fantastic collections present. It is a bit of a theme park in a manner of speaking, but it's an Imperial theme park created for the emperors. I'd like to Move a vote of thanks, I guess. Uh, or Gary, would you like to do that? Well, yes, thank you, Mark and Julian, for coming and having a splendid uh, talk to our audience. Um, I will, one point I will take from this is the quiet placards. 
So maybe I should start making them and walking around the library. <laughs> so um, I'm going to invite my co-organizer from the Hong Kong Trade Development Council, Eric Chan, to come up and say a few words and before I close. Thank you so much, everyone, to be Gary and uh, the two speakers. But, um, so um, very happy for everyone to come in today. So um, before uh, we proceed to uh, end this, this session, uh, I would like to do a little bit promotion of the upcoming book fair. So on your seats, you should find a piece of paper. And this is actually the uh, comment form for the event. And uh, of course, we will take uh, value uh, your comments to this event. But we also have a special prize prepared for you because um, in book fair, we have a display which uh, will show uh, this particular event and a highlighted comments like the best response from you guys. And uh, the selected one will win a fabulous, fabulous prize of the uh, Hong Kong Book Fair ticket. <laughs> so um, we surely encourage you to uh, fill in the form. Uh, my colleagues uh, will be handing out some pencils and pens should you leave one. And uh, thank you very much again. And I'll pass the stage back to you. Okay, thank you, Eric. Um, before uh, Julian and Mark leaves, the library would like to present a gift for being here and having a talk for us. Um, we'd like to give you a replica of our Hong Kong Almanac and Directory from 1846. And I believe Mark will be staying to sign books. Yeah, sorry, can I just give another plug? If you could bear to sit through this again. On the 19th of July, we'll have another talk about this year's book, which is called Israel and China from the Tang Dynasty to Silicon Wadi. We've also got 50, more than 50 historical photographs. And that will be the book fair. Uh, it's uh, 3 o'clock in the afternoon on the 19th in room S222. So please, uh, if you can make time, we welcome you to come. Thank you. Also, just to let you know, we will have another talk uh, in, co in collaboration with the uh, Hong Kong Trade Development Council uh, with Chip Chow, and that will be on the 9th, July 9th, Monday. Hope to see you here again. Thank you.